They had to follow the rules of the Canadian justice system. I call it the Canadian criminal system, because <laughs> that's basically what it is. It's the criminals that have all the rights. On Halloween night in 1992, a small town in Kipling, Saskatchewan anticipated a bit of spooky fun. But for Candace Fonagy, the horrors that unfolded that night would extend far beyond what she could have expected. Firstly, she just found out that her boyfriend was cheating on her. Then, when she went to visit her friend at a local hospital, she couldn't find her. Candace was getting increasingly anxious. Seeking comfort from Dr. John, the only doctor in the town, Candace let him administer her an injection, but soon she could feel herself being stripped and assaulted. She reported Dr. John, the favorite doctor of everyone, to the police. He denied doing any such thing, so neither police nor anyone else believed her claims. This Halloween night haunted the entire community for years as everyone kept speculating who was lying, Dr. John or Candace. Then, after five long years, a new angle came to light that changed the whole story. So what was this new twist? And who had been lying all this while? Welcome to M7 Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved, and twisted cases across the world. Today, we're looking at the twisted case of Candace Fanaghi. Nestled in rural Canada, the charming town of Kipling, Saskatchewan has a rich history. Its name pays tribute to the famous author Rudyard Kipling. Starting as a tiny settlement in the early 1900s, Kipling blossomed into a cozy town housing just around a thousand people. With a school and library at its heart, the town's landscape boasts low-rise buildings and spacious streets. You'll discover farming supply stores, a cozy cafe, a handful of eateries, a co-op, and more. Kipling takes pride in being a hub for healthcare and learning in the area. The tight-knit community of Kipling is like a big family. During holidays, the whole town comes alive with celebrations. Halloween sees kids bundled up in costumes, wandering the streets for treats, and there's an enchanting festive atmosphere that sweeps through the chilly air. But Halloween of 1992 was life-changing for 23-year-old resident of Kipling, Candace Fanaghi. On October 31, 1992, a young woman named Candace Fanaghi was working at a gas station just like any other day. But this day turned out to be different. Her boyfriend Danny showed up and they got into a huge argument because Danny had done something that really upset Candace. To her horror, he'd asked another girl out to dinner and that was the last straw for Candace. She had enough of his lies. In her anger, she kicked Danny's truck and left a dent in it. Danny left, leaving Candace seething with frustration. She was so mad that she left her work and decided to visit a friend at the Kipling Memorial Union Hospital to cool down. But things didn't go as planned. Candace arrived at the Kipling Memorial Union Hospital, hoping to find her friend there but she wasn't around. Candace was still really upset and finding it hard to calm down. She realized she needed some help to settle her emotions. So when a nurse suggested she should talk to a doctor, Candace accepted the suggestion. Dr. John Schneeberger was on duty that night. Born on January 1st, 1961 in Zambia, John Schneeberger came from a family that loved learning. He attended the respected Kearsney College in South Africa where he stood out in school and made many friends. It was no shocker when he followed in his brother's footsteps and entered medical school. Leaving behind his days at Kearsney, he continued his education at the University of Stellenbosch near Cape Town. He graduated in December of 1984, proving himself to be an exceptional student, especially in anesthesiology. Around 1987, John Schneeberger moved to Canada and settled in Kipling, located in the south of Saskatchewan. After fulfilling all the requirements to be a doctor in Canada, he officially joined the medical team at Kipling Medical Center in December 1988. Soon enough, everyone was talking about the dashing young doctor with a unique accent who'd just arrived in town. He was one of just two doctors in the whole area. It didn't take long for him to become known as Dr. John. His first name became his badge. The townsfolk really took to him 
and he carved a reputation as a caring and kind doctor in this small, tight-knit community. His smooth way and polished manners made him a hit with everyone, especially with the ladies. He shared that his female patients were so smitten that they'd sometimes pretend to be sick just to see him. He was tall, good-looking, and very charismatic. He was the town's most eligible bachelor. At his doctor's office, he met Lisa Dillman, a single mom with two kids. In 1991, they tied the knot. He embraced Lisa's children like his own, even cheering them on at sports events. The couple were blessed with two more daughters, born just a year apart. Dr. John wasn't only good at regular doctoring. He realized that the town needed more specialized medical care. So, despite being a full-time doctor and a dad of four, he trained even more and became an expert in obstetrics and gynecology by 1992 at age 38. In addition to all of this, he was also leading a group to gather money for a new swimming pool that the whole town could enjoy. He also took charge of a special class about relationships and related material at the high school. Life was looking great for Dr. John, but things were about to take a turn. Candace knew Dr. John well because he'd helped her deliver her baby just nine months earlier. She opened up to him about her fight with Danny and how she was worried about her strong reaction. What I told him was that I was so mad at Danny that, that uh, I felt like killing him. But I didn't actually mean that I was going to go out and kill him. I was just describing the, how angry I was. I had just expected that he would give me a couple pills or something. Um, just to relax my muscles, calm me down. Dr. John had actually seen Candace and Danny arguing before at a fundraiser for the local swimming pool. He knew Candace had a fiery side, and this time she just couldn't calm herself down. Dr. John stepped out of the room for a quick moment and returned holding a tiny syringe. Candace was a bit surprised because she thought she'd get some pills to take, but the doctor explained that a shot would work better considering her situation. Candace trusted him, so she offered her right arm for the shot. As soon as the medicine went in, her body started feeling really heavy, like it was asleep. She could hardly move. With Dr. John's help, she moved from the chair to the exam bed, lying on her left side facing the wall. It was a strange feeling for Candace. The medicine that Dr. John used was called Versid, and it's a kind of sedative. It's normally used when patients have to go through painful procedures like a colonoscopy. Normally, it makes people go to sleep and forget what happened during the procedure. But, you know, everyone's different and Candace was merely paralyzed, not asleep or unconscious. In the fog of confusion, she felt someone undo her jeans and move her underwear to the side. But she couldn't react. Then the trusted doctor did the unthinkable to her. Candace wanted to yell, but all that came out was a weak, raspy sound. Like I had no control over my muscles. It's like all my muscles left and I was just this piece of jelly falling over. I tried to scream. As I was falling over, nothing would come out except for like a croaking noise that a frog would make. It was just, it was so scary. During this awful moment, she never saw anyone's face Dr. John was the only one in the room with her. After everything was over, the doctor fixed her underwear and pants. He zipped up his own pants and left the room. Candace was all mixed up, but that strong medicine made her too out of it to do anything. A nurse checked on her and saw that Candace was too tired and dizzy to drive home, so she suggested that Candace spend the night. When a dentist freezes your gums, you can't, and he's pulling, pulling your tooth out, you can't feel the, the pain from the tooth, but what you can feel is pressure of the tooth moving back and forth, and, and that's, that's the only way I can describe it. Candace didn't tell the nurse about what had happened, and feeling super confused, she went to sleep. Dr. John likely assumed that she wouldn't remember anything because of the drug, but that wasn't the case. When Candace awoke the next morning, her head felt fuzzy and she wasn't quite sure about what had happened for a moment. Dr. John was usually so kind, how could he do something so terrible? But her doubt didn't last long. She quickly remembered everything that had happened in all its details. 
she had to wait until the doctor finished his morning rounds before she could leave the hospital. When she finally saw him, she asked him about the medicine he'd given her. He was calm, then he just smiled and asked her why she wanted to know and whether it gave her wild dreams. In that moment, Candace understood he'd never confessed to what he did to her, but she didn't realize how hard it would be to prove it. Even though she was traumatized and still feeling the effects of the strong medicine, Candace managed to stay focused. What she did next was crucial if she ever wanted to show that the doctor was guilty. She took off her underwear and saw a stain. Quickly, she put her underwear in a plastic bag and sealed it up, knowing that this might be the only proof she had. Candace understood that she needed to tell someone about what had happened as soon as possible. You could tell by the look on her face that, that something terrible had happened to her, eh? Well, I was really hoping that wasn't true, eh? But uh, when we saw her, we knew it was. But she didn't feel safe reporting it in her hometown of Kipling because she knew the doctor had friends in the local police force. Instead, she decided to drive for two hours to the city of Regina. There, she went to a clinic where they could do the proper tests. The test showed that the substance on Candace's underwear was definitely bodily fluid. They also found some on her jeans and in swabs taken from her private area. The hospital immediately notified the police in Regina and Candace told them what happened. She explained that she hadn't had any kind of intercourse in the weeks before the incident, so the bodily fluid they found could only belong to the person who attacked her, Dr. John Schneeberger. Back in the early 1990s, DNA was a new thing in the world of science. The first time evidence was used to catch a criminal in Canada was in 1989, just three years prior to what happened to Candace. So, it was incredibly smart of her to go to the clinic right away to get the test done. They could use the DNA in the bodily fluid to check if it was the same as the doctor's DNA. The Kipling police were eventually made aware of the situation and went to the hospital to look into it themselves. They began to try to figure out when the assault might have taken place. They found out that there was a 20-minute period where Dr. John could have committed the assault. In the hospital that night, there was only one other man whose wife was having a baby, and he never left her alone. The police then went to Dr. John's house to question him about the incident. He was extremely upset and said that Candace was acting really crazy when she came to the hospital on Halloween night. He told them he gave her medicine to calm her down. He said Candace might have gotten things mixed up and maybe even dreamt about the assault while she was under the influence of the medicine. He suggested that she may have made these claims in order to extort him. But to prove he was innocent, he gave a sample of his blood for DNA testing. The DNA testing took a while, and for Candace, it felt like an eternity. During this time, news about Candace's claims had spread around the small town of Kipling. Not many people believed her. Because Candace didn't talk to the nurses who were working on the night of the assault, some people started to doubt if the assault really happened. Some thought that maybe Candace and the doctor had consenting intercourse and that Candace kept the evidence as a way to make the doctor pay her to drop the accusations. Some people even blamed her for what happened. Candace felt really alone during this period. On the other hand, Dr. John received a lot of support. People saw him as a good family man and there had never been any accusations against him before. The town looked up to the doctor. He was a good doctor, and he, he would never do anything like that. It was impossible. When he told his wife, Lisa, about what Candace said, she did not have any doubts about his innocence. Lisa couldn't believe that her loving husband and the father of her kids would hurt anyone. She believed that Candace might have had a crush on her husband and was saying these things to hurt him because he didn't feel the same way about her. She didn't like Candace and felt angry that she was trying to damage her husband's reputation and their family's name. By now, the DNA test results had come in, and to Candace's shock, the DNA in the bodily fluid found on her underwear didn't match Dr. John Schneeberger's blood sample. He was declared innocent. He openly shared his relief with his friends and colleagues, eager to move on. So, was it a dream after all? And if it was, how could one explain the stains on her undergarments? However, the town did not require any reasoning. 
People were convinced that Candace had wrongly accused the respected doctor and she lost several friends. Even her parents faced difficulties as they stood by Candace's side, always believing her. But Candace was not ready to back down. She was certain that Dr. John had assaulted her on Halloween, regardless of the DNA result. She pushed for a second test, absolutely convinced that Dr. John, being a medical expert, somehow manipulated his blood sample to change the results. Police had to concede that they didn't witness the initial blood test, which was required by law. Recognizing Candace's persistence, they approached Dr. John for a second blood sample. He was furious and offended by the request, but he reluctantly agreed. He understood that these accusations could tarnish his reputation and career. Throughout the ordeal, his wife Lisa stood firmly by his side, supporting him unwaveringly. In August of 1993, Dr. John went to a lab to provide a second blood sample. This time, two law enforcement officers were present to oversee the process. The doctor rolled up his left sleeve and the lab technician began to draw blood with a needle. However, Dr. John intervened, taking the needle from the technician and finishing the job himself. An RCMP officer stood nearby, observing closely. Dr. John filled one vial of blood and then he decided to fill a second vial just to be thorough. When the officer inquired about the bruises on his upper arm, Dr. John explained that the previous blood draw had injured a tendon, causing the bruising. The explanation seemed reasonable and the officer was satisfied. The officers then took the blood vials for testing. Six more months went by, during which Candace became accustomed to the spiteful looks from the people in Kipling. Despite the challenges, she held onto her conviction that she was right and that the test results would eventually prove it. However, reality didn't align with her hopes. The outcome of the second test was revealed, and once again, Dr. John's blood sample did not match the DNA profile of the fluid discovered in Candace's underwear. The case against Dr. John Schneeberger came to a close in 1994. Once again, the DNA evidence seemed to contradict what Candace knew in her heart to be true. Lisa Schneeberger was particularly vocal, suggesting that Candace was seeking financial gain from the situation. It became a matter of a single young mother's word against an esteemed physician who was also a father of four, a figure highly esteemed in the community. The judgment Candace faced in Kipling was overwhelming. Feeling like an outsider in the place she'd grown up, she knew it was time to leave. With her daughter, she bid farewell to the town and relocated to Regina. In Kipling, life continued on its usual rhythm. The Schneeberger family moved forward, leaving the story in the past. Just a week after the second DNA test results were revealed, Dr. John Schneeberger became a Canadian citizen while still holding residency rights in South Africa. However, Candace didn't want to let go, haunted by the thought that Dr. John had escaped justice. The doctor has already given two samples, and those two samples were tested and they came up as being um, having a DNA profile and the profile didn't match the uh, semen that was left at the scene. So now we're stuck where we really can't do anything. Candace also feared he might harm someone else. Feeling determined to uncover the truth, she took matters into her own hands. With the assistance of her lawyer, she enlisted the help of a private investigator. Larry O'Brien, a retired member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police with 25 years of experience, had transitioned into working as a private investigator. After their initial conversation, he was convinced of Candace's honesty. He shared her suspicion that something wasn't right with Dr. John's DNA tests. They needed to find another way to demonstrate his guilt, a different approach to obtaining his DNA. O'Brien's initial attempt was quite clever. He had an assistant pose as a representative from a local radio station and visit Dr. John Schneeberger's place. The assistant tricked the doctor into participating in a fake contest and putting his entry into an envelope. After John sealed the envelope, he handed it back. It could have provided the DNA that would prove Candace's story. However, this plan didn't succeed. O'Brien later explained, something went wrong with the envelope. It got contaminated somehow, even though we randomly picked it from a new box. That shouldn't have happened. In a close-knit town like Kipling, secrets were rare. People knew each other's business. 
the Schneeberger's cleaning lady was familiar with Candace's family and informed Lisa that the Fanegis had hired a private investigator. Lisa believed that the unpleasant situation was over and was furious to learn that Candace hadn't given up. Within a week, Candace's family received a letter stating that they were no longer welcome at the Kipling Medical Center. This was a significant issue in a town with only two doctors. If they fell ill, they'd have to seek medical assistance outside of Kipling. On Saturday, March 23, 1996, Larry O'Brien followed Dr. John in his car, waiting for him to park. The doctor's car had personalized plates with the first part of his last name, Schnee. There was no mistaking that this was the car of the man Candace believed had assaulted her. As soon as Dr. John was out of sight, the private investigator tried the driver's door, which, like most cars in Kipling, was unlocked. He knew exactly what he was searching for. He discovered strands of hair on the driver's seat headrest. He also checked the ashtray and found a used chapstick. It looked new, but when he opened it, he noticed the edge was worn. It had been used before. He rubbed it on the window area of an envelope and sealed it in a forensic bag. Candace borrowed money from her parents and paid an independent lab to conduct DNA tests. The hair samples didn't have roots, making them untestable. However, there was leftover saliva on the chapstick. After two weeks, the results arrived. It did not match Dr. John's blood sample. But there was yet another twist in the story. The DNA on Dr. John's chapstick was a match to the stain found in Candace's assault kit. I knew it all along. It wasn't a shock that something was going to match, but it was a, it was a bit of relief because at least we had that to prove to the police. What Candace had always believed was finally confirmed. Dr. John Schneeberger was indeed the one who had assaulted her. It took her four years to establish this, but the battle was far from finished. Despite the evidence from the chapstick, a major hurdle stood in their way. Because they definitely couldn't prove that John was the sole user of the chapstick, and only because the private investigator had gathered evidence by entering his car without permission, that evidence would be deemed unacceptable in court. They shared the evidence with the police, but their hands were somewhat tied. However, the evidence managed to convince the police that Candace was speaking the truth. They were certain of Dr. John's guilt. They just needed to find a different route to demonstrate it. The officers approached John with the evidence unearthed by Candace's private investigator and asked for a third blood sample. On November 20th, 1996, Dr. John underwent another blood draw. This time, the police documented the entire process. When the nurse aimed to prick his finger, the doctor declined, explaining that he had a condition that would result in severe bruising if blood were taken from his hands. He extended his arm and cooperated. Without a court order, they couldn't force him to do something against his will. In the video recording of the testing procedure, you can hear the nurse expressing her surprise. The blood she'd just drawn from the doctor's left arm didn't appear fresh. It had a dark brown color, as if it were old. It's a little strange in that, you know, like the blood doesn't look. You know, kind of fresh, I don't know. When the sample was examined, the technicians concluded that its quality was poor, making it impossible to conduct proper testing. Candace was furious. Why did they accept the blood if it seemed off? Why didn't they insist on another sample while the doctor was still at the lab? She'd come so far in proving that Dr. John wasn't the person he portrayed himself to be. She wasn't about to give up now. In a last-ditch effort, Candace took a bold step and filed a civil lawsuit against the doctor. She also reported his actions to the local medical society. During the court proceedings, it was clear that most people were on Dr. John's side. His wife, Lisa, was angry that Candace had accused her husband of such a terrible deed and refused to believe it could be true. She even used hurtful language to describe Candace in an interview with a local TV station. If looks could kill, I would have been dead. Lisa was sitting across the table from me, and she just sat there with her arms crossed, just glaring at me like, you little bitch, you are ruining our lives. And I just sat in my chair thinking, oh my God, you're so stupid, you know? <laughs>
you are so stupid, and if you don't watch it, it's going to happen to your kids, too. Unfortunately, nothing came of the civil lawsuit, and Candace had to face the reality that Dr. John might escape the consequences of his actions. But the tides were about to change. On the 25th of April, 1997, Lisa Schneeberger discovered something that was happening inside her own family home. Her 15-year-old daughter from her first marriage told her that something strange had been going on. Her stepdad visited her room in the night and gave her an injection. When she woke up, there was a condom wrapper in her bed. She took her mom to her bedroom to show her. Lisa was horrified and asked her daughter if it had happened before. The daughter said it wasn't the first time. Lisa remembered that one time she'd asked her husband about giving her daughter an injection and he admitted to it saying that the girl had been coughing, so he just wanted to give her something to help. Lisa never heard any coughing, but didn't give it a second thought. He was the doctor after all. Lisa realized that John's abuse of her daughter had started two years before when she was only 13 years old. When Lisa asked her daughter why she hadn't said anything before, she explained her thought process. If her mom didn't believe Candace, why would she believe her? Never in her wildest dreams would she ever have imagined that the love of her life, the devoted father and stepfather, was, in fact, a predator. Lisa went into her husband's home office, where she found syringes, condoms, and sedatives, including Versed, hidden on the high shelf. I blame myself. I still blame myself. When Lisa told the police everything and kicked John out of their home, it was a big step. Candace felt shocked when she heard the news. All those years of fighting for justice, worried that John might hurt someone else, and now to know that he preyed on his own stepdaughter. It was not good news at all. Candace said she'd never forget the day she found out. I screamed, I bawled, I, I was pretty disgusted because all of these years, I mean, I'm fighting to get the truth out, but also to make sure that it didn't happen to anybody else. The police took samples from John once more, this time, hair, saliva, and blood. They took the blood from his finger. When the test results came back, they confirmed that Dr. John's DNA matched the DNA found on Candace's underwear. It also matched the DNA from the chapstick found in his car. John was arrested and faced charges for the assaults on both Candace Fanaghi and his stepdaughter. Dr. John tried to convince Lisa that he was innocent and asked her to stand by him. But Lisa, thankfully, chose to believe her daughter and turned away from Dr. John's efforts to change her mind. Lisa found herself alone with four kids, the youngest being just 13 months old. She had to sell the family car to cover the mortgage. She finally found a job at the Diabetes Association in Red Deer, Alberta. This allowed her to make a fresh start in a new place and support her family. In 1999, the trial of Dr. John Schneeberger began. Throughout the trial, he still denied the allegations. He believed that Candace had broken into his house, taken a used condom from the trash in his basement, and used the bodily fluid to make false accusations. He claimed she wanted to set him up to blackmail him and get money. When he realized what was happening, he took strong actions to defend himself, safeguard his family, and protect his reputation in the community. By strong actions, he meant manipulation of evidence. Even after his confession, nobody could figure out how he'd done it. Soon, the long-awaited moment finally arrived. Dr. John was called upon to explain how he manipulated the DNA evidence. The events that took place during this crime were truly shocking and left a lasting impact on the public. But the real shocker was yet to come when his desperate scheme finally came to light. After the first blood sample request in 1992, Dr. John had surgically inserted a tube, a 15-centimeter Penrose drain filled with another man's blood into his arm, alongside his actual vein. He'd also added anticoagulants to keep the blood fluid. When he was taken to the police lab for testing, he orchestrated the situation so that the technician drew blood from the tube instead of his actual vein. After the test, he removed the tube. He repeated this process nine months later for the second test. In April 1996, upon learning that Candace had hired an investigator, he reinserted the tube. This could explain why the nurse thought the blood seemed old. It actually was, 
as much as seven months old and belonged to one of his male patients, Danny Sabo. Upon reviewing the video recording, investigators noticed the way Dr. John had manipulated things. He consistently offered his left arm and rolled up his sleeve just above the elbow, hiding the scar from where he'd cut himself to insert the tube. In the video, there's a brief instance where you can catch a glimpse of the raised skin shaped like a tube. Candace took the spotlight as the key witness. After so many years, her voice was finally heard and respected. The defense attempted to paint her as someone seeking money and a fabricator of lies, but she didn't let that fly. Determined as ever, she emphasized that she had no ulterior motives for pursuing the truth about the doctor all those years. The defense claimed that Candace's memory of the crime was distorted due to the sedative she'd been given. Candace confronted John's lawyer and said, We'll drug you on Versed, and you can explain to us how it feels. It took seven years before Dr. John Schneeberger was finally found guilty of assault, administering a noxious substance, as well as the obstruction of justice. He was sentenced to six years in prison for these offenses. The maximum penalty for these offenses were typically life imprisonment, so he got off very lightly. Besides, he wasn't convicted for the assault of his stepdaughter, as there was not enough conclusive evidence. Still, Candace Fanaghi felt vindicated. I won again! <laughs> That's so exciting. Uh, he lost. He lost both, both of his chances to get out for day parole and full parole. Oh my God, isn't that great? Woohoo! Oh, anyway, I was so worried that he was gonna get out and everybody was gonna fall for his lies and bullshit again, but they didn't. They didn't, they're smarter than the rest. Oh my God, do you guys know how exciting this is for me? It's like celebration. After the trial, she said, this is a glorious day that I've waited for for seven years. I hope he rots because that's exactly what he deserves for all the hurt caused by John. He was stripped of his medical license by the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Saskatchewan for misusing his position of trust. Lisa Schneeberger filed for a divorce. Even after being sentenced, Dr. John insisted on maintaining his parental rights, and Lisa was forced to take their daughters to visit him in jail on the last Sunday of every month. They also had to phone him every Monday for an hour-long conversation. When visiting him in the prison, the girls were often in tears, seeking refuge behind their mom. They were afraid of their dad and didn't want to be near him or talk to him. He'd harmed their sister and shattered their family. The social worker intervened, putting an end to the meeting, explaining that it was too distressing for the little girls aged five and six. Even John himself recognized that it was no suitable way for his daughters to meet with them and conceded that Lisa didn't have to bring them back. Lisa was afraid that he'd get out of prison in six years and cause even more hurt to the family. So she informed immigration authorities that he'd lied on his citizenship application, saying that there was no investigation against him. He was then deported to South Africa where he held permanent residence status. Out of options, he moved to Durban to live with his mother. Unable to get his medical license back, he worked on some catering jobs and turned to religion. In the past few years, John joined the Durban Wine Academy, connected to the Cape Wine Academy, and got approval to lead wine tasting courses and provide sommelier training. Candice Fanaghi found happiness in marriage and worked as a care assistant in a Saskatchewan addiction services facility. As for Lisa Dillman, she remains convinced that her former husband shows no signs of remorse. Her life was turned upside down, but she focused on caring for her daughters. She said, at least I can say to my girls when they're older, I tried. They'll know that mummy at least tried to keep us away from him. Do you think Dr. John committed more such crimes? What do you think about the reactions of locals? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. Also, if you want us to cover a case, please mention it in the comment section below. We'd love to hear from you. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, stay safe.